you're about to enter into a new world of knowledge, curiosities, and high strangeness. This is a podcast of Straight Up Strange Productions. You're listening to Mysteries and Monsters. I'm your host, Paul Bestel. October 1973, in Pascagoula, Mississippi, and two friends who were enjoying a spot of fishing ended up being caught in what has become the most witnessed abduction case in modern history. Philip Mantle returns to discuss some of the incredible evidence, new witnesses and oddities he's uncovered in the last few years, and has now chronicled in his new book, co-authored with Dr. Irina Scott, Beyond Reasonable Doubt, The Pascagoula Alien Abduction. But before we get to the episode, don't forget, you can support Mysteries and Monsters by signing up at patreon.com slash mysteries and monsters. $4 a month gets you ad-free episodes, guaranteed early releases, bonus content, and more. You can also click the link in the show notes as usual. Thank you to my latest patrons, Dav, Bry, and Trent. Welcome to the team. Thank you to my continued supporters on Patreon. And if you prefer, you can now use Apple Podcast Subscriber System and you'll get the same bonuses. So add free episodes, early releases and bonus content. And you can find the link for that in the show notes as well. Mysteries and Monsters is across all social media platforms. Please subscribe to the Mysteries and Monsters channel on YouTube. You can also visit mysteriesandmonsters.com for episodes, news and merchandise. Thank you to the wonderful Weary Pines for my marvellous intro and outro music. Thank you to Dean Bestall for his marvellous artwork. The show is produced by Brennan Storr of the Ghost Story Guys, and Mysteries and Monsters is delighted to be a part of the Straight Up Strange Network. Sadly, the day after I recorded this interview with Philip, we were saddened to discover that Calvin had passed away at the age of 68. As he once said about that particular night, It completely changed my life. It's just a deal in life that happens, and you don't have any control over it. Maybe if I was a little bit older, I would have handled it better, but I wasn't, and I didn't. And here, Philip explains just how compelling Calvin and Charles Hickson's story is on that strange night 50 years ago. It's October 1973 and two men are indulging in a spot of fishing on a balmy southern evening, simply enjoying some quality downtime. What occurred in the following hours of that event changed Charles Hickson and Calvin Parker's lives forever. As we approach the 50th anniversary of this event, Philip Mantle joins me to discuss his new book, co-written with Dr. Irina Scott, Beyond Reasonable Doubt, The Pascagoula Alien Abduction. Philip! Welcome back, my friend. My pleasure, Paul. Nice to speak to you. Always a pleasure, Philip. Always a pleasure. And whenever you've got one of your books out or one of your numerous authors, I'm always excited and interested to spend some time in your company and have a chinwag about all these wonderful things you cover. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Paul. I can assure you, mate. Philip, as as I was saying before we started the interview properly, we were having a, a chinwag and a bit of a catch up. The Pascagoula case... I'm I'm very fond of this case because it's it's introduced me to a lot of people. It's introduced me to you and your authors and the people that I've got to know. I've met you at a conference on the back of this, seen the documentaries that were being produced. I've interviewed Calvin. I've interviewed Dr. Irina Scott. I've a lot of time for this case, Philip. Has it developed a similar kind of feeling towards yourself? Because you've invested a lot of time in this, as this new book proves. And from what you know now to when you started digging about looking into this case several years ago would you say it's become part of your ufo dna these days absolutely paul absolutely i mean when i when i first contacted calvin parker it was just to get an interview um i had obtained the rights to republish charles hickson's book that he wrote with william mendes and Charlie sadly died in, in 2011. And uh, I thought if I get an interview with Calvin, I didn't know if he was still alive, but I couldn't find any obituary for him. So I assumed he was. I thought it would just give a little update, you know, and um, 
And that was it. I mean, that that was that was my intention, Paul. Nothing else. Took me about three months to find Calvin, which I I, I eventually did, and he was very polite, but he didn't tell me an awful lot. Yes. <laughs> you know, but uh, unbeknownst to me, behind the scenes, his wife had been at him, and I came along just at the right time. <laughs> Some people have said I ghost uh, wrote Calvin's books. I didn't. He wrote them himself. I guided him. And uh, when he was writing his first book, he would send me something. I'd say, right, I need to know more about that. Expand on the, that a bit. I don't know what you mean by this. Uh, and, you know, eventually we get there. But he, he wrote it, not me. I'm not, I'm, I'm not his ghostwriter. Hmm. But, um, and, and of course, we became, became friends. But what none of us could foresee what was going to happen um he wrote two books and then things started to happen other people started to come out of the woodwork or colleagues that i'd never previously known about contacted me and said oh did you know i interviewed somebody who saw something that night in in october 1973 and i've got an interview with them and so things started to take off and there was a period of time, Paul, when my wife said I looked like a man on a mission, mm. you know, because things were coming in at a fast uh, pace. And that's when I teamed up with, with um, Dr. Scott. And uh, we also had some help in the early days by a chap called Douglas Wilson in America, who's part of MUFON. Yeah. Sadly, there, w there was no one in the Mississippi area. We didn't have anyone on the ground. So when, for example, we find a new witness, I would normally make the initial contact. Um, but, I, you know, I have to admit, I didn't always get when I'm ringing these people across the Atlantic, I didn't always get the time, the time differences. Right. Yes. And then they have this strange sounding fellow from across the Atlantic phoning them <laughs> with this strange accent, you yeah. know. Um, <laughs> so I. I I'm very fortunate and extremely honoured to work with Dr. Scott. I mean, I'd been publishing Dr. Scott's books anyway, and I said, Irene, can you help with this? And we teamed up. And uh, even if I do say so myself, I think we've made a good team. Uh, and we're still working together as well. You know, there's, there's more things on the horizon in that respect. And um, so it is now part of my, my ufological DNA uh, I think I think about the case probably every day, mm. you know, or or some part of it, or or some new information, and of course, when now that the book's out, you know, I'm speaking to uh, people, lovely people like yourself, so I I have I'm, I'm hopeless with a diary, Paul. I've got I've got to be honest, so I just get a big sheet of paper and write, you know. August interviews, <laughs> September's interviews, and so on. So f they're in your face. They're not stuck in some little diary. Otherwise, I forget. <laughs> uh, and I'm very grateful for them. I'm very grateful indeed. Yeah, I, I know that feeling, Philip. I have everything in triplicate. I've got a calendar on my wall. I've got a diary, and I've also got a big list. <laughs> well, there you go. I've got, I've got my wife with the diary. She says, "Do you know you're speaking to so and so tonight?" <laughs> oh, I, got, I forgot about that, you know. <laughs> and off I go. <laughs> I think there are two things about this case that, even now, I think when I look back, it baffles me a bit. One is, I can't understand how this case seemed to just disappear and gather dust for so long, Philip. Because obviously, as we'll as we'll dive into later, Charles was the was the main hub of everything that went forward after the event calvin yeah. took a step back and just didn't want to be deal with yeah. anything until until it sort of pulled him back 45 years later near enough yeah so i'm i'm perplexed as to why it was allowed to drift away for so long well it, it's it's simple paul there, there was no torchbearer for it i mean charlie hickson had been the torchbearer and uh and uh, once he passed away there was no one else to 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 carry the flag. Mm -hmm. Calvin, as you said, shied away from it completely if he could. He, in fact, down the years, he would occasionally crop up, usually at Charlie's behest. But if he had had his way, he used to say, I wish I wish Charlie would stop talking about it. You know, mm -hmm. just just forget about it. And um, but of course, he didn't. And, and that's why, Paul, when I when I set out to try and find Calvin, 
there's nobody nobody knew where the hell he was hmm. um I, I contacted some UFO researchers in Mississippi. They had even never heard of the case, ne- ne- let alone Calvin Parker's phone number. And, and they sent me some links online. I thought, I, I don't need links. I, could, I, I know how to use Google. Yeah. You, know, <laughs> you know, it kind of it really annoyed me, I have to be honest. But, um, you know, I, I've got it. I found him in the end. And, um, you know, things... Thankfully, I mean, what Calvin asked me to do, Paul, uh, he'd been ill before I met him. He'd had a stroke. He'd had two lots of open heart surgery, mm. but he was fit and able when, when I met up with him. He um, he wanted to leave a legacy, and the legacy was he wanted to tell his story and find out as much about what happened that night as he could. And we 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 shook hands on it. Not that we've ever met physically, if, if you yeah. know what I mean. And I. I said to him, I will do whatever I can to help you in any way whatsoever. Uh, and I've, I've stuck to that and I'm still sticking by that. And, um, you know, the search continues and, um, you know, it's, it's been part of my life ever since. Yeah. I mean, so there's that aspect to it. And, and, and the other aspect is when you look at what happened initially and what went on over sort of probably the first 20 years more than anything, Philip, you know, we've got some of the, the greatest names in ufology dipping in and out of this case. You know, we've got Heineck when it originally happened. You've got James yep. Harder assisting mm-hmm. him. You know, 20 years later, we've got Bud Hopkins doing some hypnotic regression. Yeah. And yet it takes Hickson passing away and this story reemerging sort of the mid tens, sort of 10, 15 years ago, Philip, and you tracking down Calvin, who had been essentially living under a pseudonym for the for that period so people couldn't find him mm. I, I just find it baffling how nobody else stumbled across this case because i would heard of it and i know you read something about it in the mid 80s i believe philip when we've talked yeah, about yeah. it before there, there was a series of mag a, a, a series magazine i think it was the called simply called the unexplained you know yes. you got one once a fortnight and i think it was in that but i read about it in a magazine and it always stuck in my mind especially the, the description of the creatures that they encountered, they are totally unique. Mm. You cannot find another description like that whatsoever. And it was just that that stuck in my head. And in the 90s, I, I organized some, if, even if I'd say so myself, some hugely successful UFO conferences here in the UK. Yes. And I tried to get um, Charles Hickson at one of them. In fact, on one of the posters for one of the conferences, his name is on it because we thought he was going to come. But something went wrong and, and, he, and he, he didn't make it. And, and that was it finished. I didn't have the contact with him. It was someone else. And, um, yeah, the case was dead and buried. It really was. But you know, even now, some people will say, well, what can you learn from a case that's 50 years old? I said, well, why do we still talk about Roswell? You know, that's 70, 70 odd years old. Yeah. Why do we still talk about Kenneth Arnold? You yeah. know, that's where, where, you know, where it all began, the modern era. Yeah. So you can learn a lot from history. And we have to remember, yes, it's 50 years ago. But there's still people alive who were there and were part of it. It's not... Like Roswell, as far as I'm aware, none of those that were a witness to anything at Roswell is now alive. It, it, it's like it's like the last Tommies from the First World War. Yes, they're all sadly they're all they've all passed, you know. And and I said, you, there's a lot we can learn from from history, and if you you ignore it at your peril, you really do. And, um, you know, I didn't know that this case was going to turn out the way it did. But hey, ho, there you go. I'd always been in the modern version of me, Philip, before I started this program. I'd, I'd kind of pushed abduction cases to, to the side. I just didn't think there was any value in them. I'll be brutally honest. Mm. And then I spoke with Calvin back on ooh, episode 38, I think it was. And my conversation with Calvin changed my mind completely because, yeah. as you've mentioned here we've got a guy very normal afraid of publicity kept himself to himself hid away from it didn't chase it just wanted to get on with his life with his childhood sweetheart who he'd been with ever since the event as well yep. and it over overnight philip i went from load of old nonsense to i have no idea what's going on anymore then 
it completely changed my opinion because I was just struck by his sincerity, his honesty, and his and just so how down to earth he is. Yeah, well, that, that's you know when it, when we decided to write when he when we wanted to write his book, um, he said I'll do it, do it on one condition. I said, what's that? So you don't change anything in it. And he said, if I spell something wrong or or I talk the way I talk, you leave it as it is because he said. I want people to know me and not just what happened to me. Uh, and, and I think that comes out in, in, in the book. You know, this is a, a guy who had no real formal education, but not, not stupid by any respect. He's a very smart fella. I did just exactly as he asked. And he is, he is a wonderful man. And, um, and he constantly make, I, I'll give you an example. Calvin is seriously, seriously ill. Mm. His mum recently died, and she'd been in a nursing home for some some time. Couldn't even recognise him now. Mm. But every Friday night, Calvin used to take his guitar down to the nursing home and sing songs for all the residents. Mm. That is the kind of fella he is. Mm. And that speaks volumes for me. And he said, look, Philip, I don't care if anybody believes me or not. You know, but if they call me a liar, <laughs> they're in trouble, <laughs> and uh, that's that's the difference. And uh, and he's told me. I mean, I'll tell you a little story about. It, it was a time that he was actually um, a bounty hunter. Mm. That's what that's what he did for a living. <laughs> and he said, I went to get this guy one night, and he said, I, I took a baseball bat with me. <laughs> And he says, the biggest mistake I ever did, because the fella took the baseball bat off me and, <laughs> and beat me with it. <laughs> he, said, he says, I learned after that, I always take my gun. They don't argue with the gun. <laughs> and that just made me laugh, you know. <laughs> it just made me laugh. But that's that's the kind of fella he was, you know, mm. um, and still is. I mean, he's still with us. And, uh, you know, well, even when he's gone, we'll not have heard of the last of, of Calvin Parker, if, if I have anything to do with it anyway. Mm. There's a lot of this case as well, like I said. When, once I spoke to, to Calvin, and obviously I've also spoken to our mutual friend Stefanos, who, whose part in this is one of those, is it a happy coincidence, Philip? Was it meant to be? Absolutely. It's one, it's one, of, those, one of those crazy questions, because, because there are a couple of aspects to what happened with Stefanos that just make you scratch your head about, why? What is going on here? Because here he is. He's in the Merchant Navy, but he's obsessed with UFOs and he works and he's involved in a Greek UFO team. Yeah. Or group. In, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. he gets a, he gets changed at the last minute to a ship in the Greek Merchant Navy where he's working. Yeah. And they end up calling it Pascagoula, which he's aware of because of this case with it. I think this is like 1981. Yeah. He starts poking around and ends up m meeting somebody who is a Greek immigrant who yeah. therefore takes Stefanos in to his hospitality to look after him and take him around the area. I mean, for that series of coincidences... Well, it's amazing fall. because th that was really the catalyst. We knew way back in 1973 there were a couple of eyewitnesses that were interviewed then, Yeah, you know, and we have their record. Um, Stefanos, you know, Greek Merchant Navy, radio operator... UFO researcher, docked in Pascagoula, set off to find Charles Hickson and interview him, which he did. But he went to the police station and it was them that said, oh, you, you should speak to Pastor Emmanuel Sigalas. Mm. He, he had a sighting as well. So he, they gave him his address and he went and interviewed him. Uh, and like you said, showed him around. Um, but what was interesting, uh, Pastor Sigalas that night, October the 11th, 1973, with a chap called uh, Mr. Broaders, who was part of the police and probation service, and a young lady in the back of the car who was a church volunteer, were en route to a, a meeting uh, um, with people who had alcohol problems. Mm. This was a church-sponsored meeting, and um, she was the first to see it out of the passenger side. And this thing came right across the front, right across them, over the road, heading in the general direction of where Charlie and Calvin were. Now, you know, we got the interview uh, from Stephanos in Greece, so we have that. Uh, and I got a couple of newspaper cuttings where they're mentioned as well. But in this interview, he couldn't remember the lady's name in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the back of the seat, mm. back seat, back of the car, sorry. 
because she was a church volunteer. She wasn't a local. She she only lived in, in the Pascarool area, I think, for a short time. Uh, anyway, we managed to find her name. And uh, she's called Joanne Hallmark. Hmm. And we managed to get an old black and white photograph of her from the 1970s. And, and we set off on a search for her. I found a couple of social media accounts that she'd had, but they hadn't been used in years and years, Paul. Mm. And I left messages on them, got no response. And about a year later, I went back to these social media accounts, even though they were defunct. And I noticed on one of them, it mentioned the name of a church. So I just put that church's name in, in Google and hey, presto. I found it. It wasn't in Mississippi. It was in Maryland. Mm. And um, the church even had a website. And on that website, there was a couple of sermons. And they were done by a fellow called Hallmark. Mm. And I'm thinking, is that her husband or is it her son's? So anyway, I'm guessing here, I had no idea, the the church had a general uh, email address, you know, info at church, whatever it was called. So I emailed and I said, I'm looking for this lady. Uh, and she worked with Pastor Sigalas in, in Pascagoula back in the 1970s. That's all I said. And about four weeks later, lo and behold, she contacts me. She confirms, you know, she worked in Pascagoula. So I, I couldn't hold back. I had to tell her now, you know, what I was looking for. Mm. So I did. I explained it. And again, it was about three or four weeks. She came back and she said, yeah. And she confirmed it all, passed it. I got a phone number for her, passed it on to uh, Irina. She spoke to her on the phone. And it was, probably, it was the first time in 50 years that anybody had spoken to her about it. Mm -hmm. and, and nobody had ever interviewed her. You know, nobody ever got an interview with her, but she's in our book. Uh, and we have a, a modern day photograph that she sent us of what she looks like now. Yeah. And that's how things turn up. We've been criticized, people saying, oh, People have stepped forward now for their 15 minutes of fame. Well, people like um, Mrs. Hallmark didn't step forward. We we managed to locate her. Uh, and she, not that she wasn't the only one like that. We just managed to do it. This is what UFO research and investigation is all about. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating. Eh? And I, I was over the moon that we'd, we'd managed to speak to her because, you know, I, I was just chuffed. Uh, that's that's a that's that's a I think that must be a typical British saying that. Paul. Yes. Chuffed. <laughs> you said you were chuffed to an American. I wonder what you were on about. Chuffed but, a but bit. Chuffed. <laughs> and, and that's just one example of the kind of things that we've managed to uncover, Paul, and, and place for examination in the new book. Mm. It's as simple as that. Mm. The whole 15 minute of fame excuse never washes with me for it because I see the absolute dog's abuse people get for coming forward with these kind of encounters. And and I'm sure you have far more than I could ever even dream of, Philip, over the years. You only have to look at what happened to the to the Cash Landrum witnesses. They were accused of all sorts. Yeah. It happens in all fields, be it the paranormal, cryptozoology, ufology, anybody. People go, oh, yeah, they just want to be famous. I mean. You know this better than I do, Philip. How many millionaires do we know have seen a UFO? Yeah, exactly. You know, it, it's just nonsense. Yeah. Um, and and but a lot of the people that we've we've interviewed and found, Paul, didn't step forward anyway. Yeah. We found them by one way or another. I'll give you another example. Calvin Parker was uh, having a book signing in Pascagoula. This old boy comes up. Can I have a you know a book, Mister Mister Parker? Sign it. To, you know, here's my money. And as he's walking away, he says, oh, I saw the UFO that night. And Calvin thought, well, he's gone now. Luckily, someone was taking photographs. Yeah. And there we have a photograph of this man buying a book. So, again, we use social media for this. Uh, and I think it was the, the library in Pascagoula that contacted me and they said, I know who that is. I'll contact him and ask him if he'll speak to you. And he said, yeah. And his name was Mr. Lewis Lee. Mm. Now, Mr. Lee was working in the shipyard that night on the other side of the Pascagoula River. He was a crane operator. And he says, Philip, my, my cab's about 10 or 12 feet off the ground. I got in my cab that night, and he says, I looked out across the river, and I could see this darn thing. He said, I've never seen anything like it in my life. And he said, the only reason I took my eyes off it was because 
my colleagues down on uh, you know on the ground they couldn't see it from their vantage point you know you're shouting at him what are you doing you know <laughs> and he said when i looked back it, it had gone mm. so M- mr lee didn't step forward you know we it, we we managed to locate him uh, and interviewed him uh, i spoke to him on the phone and and, and uh, irena did too sadly he passed away this year mm. so we have a memorial for him and others in in the book um because my wife was right in a way uh, Paul, when she said I, I was like a man on a mission, I felt that when when we either found these witnesses or some of them that, you know, did did come forward, that we should make every effort to interview them as fast as possible. Because it's, it is 50 years ago. So people are in the late 60s, 70s, even their 80s. And who knows what might happen? And we had an example of that. Calvin Parker was in a, a local shop uh, on the running to Christmas. And again, a, a gentleman approached him and he said, are you Mr. Parker? Calvin vaguely knew him. And he said, yeah. He says, I saw the UFO that night, Mr. Parker. I believe you. So Calvin says, I'll speak to you after Christmas. OK, great. Sadly, that gentleman never made it through Christmas. Oh. So, you know, I, I, although I didn't you know, make it a, a, a big noise about it. It was our intention to interview as many people as we could, as fast as we could, just in case. Hmm. And, and like you say, there's three memorials in the book. We, inter- I mean, Calvin was was uh, met Dr. Julius Bosco going back in 1973, mm-hmm. and we have a vintage interview with Dr. Bosco in in the book. But we managed to track him down. And he was in his 90s, and there was a lot that he couldn't remember. And, he, and, and in fairness to him, he didn't try and make it up. He says, I can't remember. You'll find that in the, in whatever. Uh, but again, he's now passed away. So I'm glad we got to interview him when we did. Well, I think this is the key thing with some of these incidents. Because as, as we, you know, we were joking before we started, how quickly time flies, because I was convinced I'd spoken to you earlier this year, and it's been 18 months. <laughs> so... When we're talking about something like this that's happened 50 years ago, the first thing you have to imagine is, well, you know, obviously, if Charles Hickson was still with us, he'd be into his 90s now. Yeah. A lot of the people, anybody driving, they would be at least 70 now. So this is one of those time sensitive cases that I think, well, if you like, like we've just discussed, if you look at who's come forwards in the five or six years since you've been digging into this, Philip, and who's still with us, we've already lost several witnesses to the events yeah absolutely Um, absolutely or or, or people that were involved in one way or another absolutely and it's imperative that i i feel that if someone steps forward i can i can be a bit um i can say stubborn yeah Uh, you know um that's that's just part of my nature and um but it it can work in your advantage and say oh you know there's one guy who, who will not uh, permit us an interview and it irritates the living daylights out of me but I can't force him Yeah, I'm not going to mention any names or anything like that and I'm saying look you know he knows Calvin he's met Calvin because Calvin is extremely ill you're okay at the moment but I, I myself had a near fatal heart attack at, at the age of 41 mm. you know not an old boy he just came out of the blue so I, I said it's imperative that we get what you're part of the story documented for posterity but he won't have it so and whilst it irritates me there's nothing i can do about it mm. and uh, i just hope he he changes his mind i've took he knows where i am and um but yeah so time does fly mate and, and we never know what's what's around the corner do we no not at all and i only you know, i only have to think about your last book last year philip when we were talking about ufo uk landings yeah and you had that incredible story in there about that old guy who wrote about the event from oh a, yes a hundred years ago and yes. just wrote a book for his family and it somehow yes. ended up getting onto your onto your lap philip that was amazing uh, i you know i love stuff like that absolutely i mean the parallels for those kind of things are just there and, you know and as, as you know philip you've been knee deep in this for almost 50 years yourself well let me let me tell you something now that i've not told anyone else and it, it's it, it's a little thing that's cropped up um just a couple of weeks ago a lady by the name of chelsea norton prince 
who runs the uh, Ocean Springs Historical Society in Mississippi. Mm-hmm. It's, right, it's right by Pascagoula. Now, one of their members, a, na- a name by the name of Bethany Fayard, said to her, I know you've got an interest in this thing that happened, with, you know, with Calvin and what have you. I've got a couple of boxes of letters and papers that used to belong to Charles Hickson. Wow. When he died in 2011, my mum and dad, she says, bought his house. Oh. And all this stuff was in it. And she said, I've just found these in the garage. <laughs> she said, what she said to you, there used to be more, but she'd given some of it away previously. And anyway, immediately, this lady by the name of Chelsea Norton Prince knew of my involvement and contacted me. Yeah. And within no time at all, and I, again, I thanked her, but I can't thank her enough. <laughs> She digitized every single piece of it. Wow. And uh, there's like 1,500 scans. Oh. Some of these are just envelopes with somebody's name on. Two little things that really cropped up that I find fascinating. One was a sketch of the UFO by Charlie Hickson himself. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's no uh, smoking gun, but it's a piece of history. But Charlie also did a, a 1 to 20 list of the description of the creatures that night. It's like bullet points we do online now, you know, on a, a, but he wrote, you know, size of nose, size of chest, length of arms, this kind of stuff. Hmm. But in amongst all this is letters from people, uh, most of whom you, we will never know who they were. But there are some notable ones, Betty Hill, Bud Hopkins, to, to name but a couple. But I found what, and this is relevant to what we're talking about today in some respects, and I've only just come across it. It took me, you know, three or four days to go through every piece of this stuff. There's a chap in there, and he was actually a a physicist working for NASA. at the I think it's the Marshall Space Center. Hmm. And he says, in 1973, I tried to get NASA interested in your case, but they weren't interested. So I'm now contacting you on on a personal note. I'm interested. So here we have NASA have already set up their own UFO study or UAP study, and I think they're 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 looking to do, issue a report in the not too distant future. So haven't times changed? You know, NASA were approached in 1973 by this chap and and um, and said we're not interested. I would happily supply NASA with every piece of information we've got on this case. But uh, I think it's unlikely they would accept. But I just found it really curious, you know, that somebody who worked for NASA, you know, he's a NASA employee, and he mentions another chap who's a friend of his, uh, and and NASA weren't interested. You know, I I find that really interesting. Mm -hmm. For me, you know, and, and, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about I'm, I may I may publish the letter. I don't know. We'll we'll see. But you're the first to know about it anyway. Fabulous, fabulous. I, I think as well with this case, Philip, there are some wonderfully strange things because, as we said earlier, Charles was the the driving force. He was the fulcrum of this. He constantly kept moving forwards, discussing the case, happy to appear on everything. I think he went on a television show pretty much within a couple of years of it being where it was like um, Truth or Dare or something. Was he telling the truth? I believe yeah, it was. Yeah, absolutely. Philip. Yeah. And we've got the letters in this collection inviting him onto it. <laughs> I think one of the things that made me smile when I heard about it is this seven inch single. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. He, he made a record. <laughs> And again, in this batch of material, there's people actually sending him a check to buy it. I've got a cop. I have one here. I managed to get one. Um, we, we've all, I already had the audio from it. And it's just Charlie telling his story. Mm. But I thought, what a great idea. You know, and if he earns a few dollars at it, fine. But th- these were the days where you could go into a studio and and make a record. And how many copies do you want making? And I, th- I think he had something like 500 made. But uh, but I, I managed to 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 to, uh, to to buy one. And um, I thought great stuff because it's, you know, it's recorded then almost for posterity. I know a lot of the vinyls ended up in the bin or it breaks, but it's great. And there, there was even a... Um, a minister, uh, a church minister, did a sermon about it, and that went on, that went on an LP as well. 
and, but on the and, and again, this is a, these are little things we found out just by accident. One of the most famous and uh, well-known, uh, you know, rock bands in, in the world is p- probably Fleetwood Mac. Yeah. And in I think it was 1976, they recorded a song called Hypnotized, and it's partially based on Charlie and Calvin's Encounter. And it's a great song as well. It's not some 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 rubbish. It's a great song. Uh, and I think it was amongst the mix to, to go on their greatest hits album, although it was never a, a, a commercial hit. It, it mm. didn't quite make it. Mm. But, yeah, it's partially based on Charlie and Calvin. Philip, I don't need any more hobbies, but I think you might have just fired me up to start one because I'm... <laughs> I've I've still got all my vinyl and I do buy more than I should and I didn't realise there was such a, a a field as such things as abduction interviews on vinyl so this is a whole new world of addiction for me Philip and I will be uh, scouring yeah. but but I know you know we've talked about these kind of l- weird little things that have influenced pop culture with you know the hot chocolate song yes that you've covered yep. in your, in your book that we mentioned earlier that's all yeah, about yep. a, um, a, an abduction the, the numerous musicians have claimed to have had sightings john lennon's probably one of the most famous so it, it's amazing how once again as we go back looking at this you know you've got one of the biggest bands probably at that point there would be a handful of bands who were bigger than fleetwood mac in 1976 really you know and they were just about to get even bigger with rumors coming out the following yeah. year philip so yeah you can only imagine that if it's touching these people who some would say are very self-obsessed and focused on their their industry and their art that they were still dipping into popular culture so it must have been fairly well known in that oh, mid 70s period absolutely when when the incident happened of course in 1973 this is some people complained and they still do this is why in the books i use as as, as many visual things as i can lay my hands on to just show people you know how, how big the case was uh, and some of these are official sort of press releases that went out Others is newspaper cuttings and so on. Just to give you an idea, it, it was huge, and and um, and it continued for quite some time. Not just in the states, but but around the world. Uh, because every now and again, somebody will say, "Oh, I'm from you know whatever country, and, we, and we, I have some news cuttings here about it, and, and they sent me copies, which I'm I'm very grateful for." So it, it it did. I've got lots and lots of digital copies of of the ufo magazines that were made at the time that covered it in a whole raft of different languages and um, so it's it's hard to you know we sit here and imagine now it's very difficult to 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 go back to those days i mean 1973 i was 15 all but ready to leave school the next year Mm. and um i'll give you another example when, when Calvin's book came out, he was contacted by a Scandinavian lady who was a very successful uh, recording artist, musician, but in the sort of what we call like the techno field, whatever the hell techno is. But you know <laughs> the guy, you know, you know what I mean. Uh, you're all right, Philip. I used to run raves, mate. I know it. I know it back to front. <laughs> but, but she did a she did a single oh. about Pascagoula. Wow. And he even has Calvin Parker talking on it, telling him what happened. And it, she re, it went out. She was a very successful lady. It went out to all a lot of the nightclubs and discos across Scandinavia. Yeah. And ah. I, I tried to imagine myself in a nightclub, you know, with all the accompaniments that it has, the lights and everything, mm. and this techno track coming out and in the middle of it. There's old Calvin with his southern drawl. <laughs> and it's amazing. We also found out that in 19, I think it was 76, Italian television uh, made a two-part TV drama all about it. It's called Extra. <laughs> and, and I've got a copy. I got a copy of it on DVD. I have no idea what they're saying. I can't speak a word of Italian. <laughs> but I said to Calvin, did you know anything about this? No idea whatsoever. You know, not a clue. Wow. So what else is lying around out there? Like these these two boxes of material that have turned up this last couple of weeks. There's no smoking gun in it, but there's some interesting little snippets. There really is. Like the the letter from the guys who work for NASA. Um, And this is what I've tried to say to people who are looking into older cases. Like Roswell, for example. Everybody who was a witness at Roswell, as far as I'm aware, is now deceased. So what you're, you're looking for is things that are in their basement, their attic. Yeah. The garage or wherever 
because it does happen. I'm going to give you another example on a funny little story to go with it. A few years back, uh, I was contacted by a fella in, in America. They have another online auction site other than eBay. It's got its own name. I can't remember what it's called, but he, he used to, you know, look for stuff on there. And there, there was a, 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 a listing for some official government UFO documents. Hmm. And I think they were only $50 or something like that. It was, it was a small amount of money. So we bought them and he went to pick them up. The gentleman who was selling them was one of the Air Force officers who worked on Project Blue Book. And the stuff he was selling were Blue Book files, <laughs> originals <laughs> that are not in the National Archives. Because he said, what we used to do, we used to bring work home. And it says he brought some of this stuff home and he never took it back. <laughs> and he says, if you want, I've got a couple more boxes. And I said to this fella, let's just publish them as they are. That was me getting it out to a bigger, just publish it as they are. You know, an introduction about, you know, the story of how you found them, who, who you got them from. And we'll just put, that's it. And uh, at first he was interested in and he, he declined. But what he says, Please forgive me if there's any animal lovers out there. This is not meant to be nasty. But in this, these files, which he, he now digitized, somebody, how, I don't know, but had got a monkey and shaved it and photographed it and sent the photographs in to Project Blue Book saying these are pictures of an alien. And <laughs> it, it tickled me pink, you know. I don't think the monkey looked all right. It didn't look like it had been hurt, you know what I mean? Mm. But. What I'm saying is, yes, there were, again, there's no smoking gun in these documents, but it shows you that things like this do crop up. They are there. And like with the Pascagoula case, we found all these little snippets. For example, there's a letter from, letter from Betty Hill yeah. um, telling Charlie about other sightings she's had. I never met Betty, but I, I did correspond with her myself. So what I did, I just sent these letters on to Kathleen Marden, yep. who's Betty's niece, of course, and she's, yeah. she's thanked me for them. But fascinating, fascinating little insights. So what else may turn up tomorrow? Who knows, Paul? Who knows? Well, it just shows you as well, Philip, because it, it it's very easy to look at some of these cases in the past, as, as we've mentioned, you know, and you think about other aspects and, and, and other famous cases like the Socorro incident and Kecksburg and Flatwoods and things like that and, and the Phoenix Lights once again. It's back in the news this week for some reason because the Kurt Russell stories hit the headlines again, which I find very odd yeah. that this story about Kurt Russell keeps surprising people because I've seen him talk about this on British television recently. I have. Yeah, I have. Which was not because I, I don't think anybody was expecting that because he was on the one show promoting Guardians. Was he Guardians of the Galaxy? Or, yeah, yeah, something or, like that. Or The yeah. Hateful Eight. He was doing a film promo anyway. And at the same time, they'd got a segment about the, I think it must have been the, 20th anniversary of the phoenix lights or something philip yeah yeah and he was on as if yeah. you know just as if by coincidence and they started talking about it and that's when he said yeah I'm, i was the pilot it's me that was me yeah. <laughs> you're just like what yeah yeah well it's like like the pascagoula case you know be, simply because what we've over what we've turned up and um and, and the amount of witnesses that that were have stepped forward or we've located i'm pretty sure there's something else um, what I don't know. I, I'll, get, I'll give the listeners another e example. When when this thing landed, uh, while they're fishing, these creatures came out. Two got hold of Charlie, one got hold of Calvin. Charlie said he felt some kind of prick or scratch on his arm. Mm. They were both taken on board and went down separate routes, so they never saw each other on board. Calvin said they laid this this creature laid me on this transparent table and it stood in the corner and then this other creature appeared pretty much pretty much looked like a female mm. and uh, at one point and he doesn't like talking about this they removed his lower clothing and took his shoes and socks off and he says they stuck something in my foot and it hurt and there's a lot more to the story to that so when I first teamed up with Calvin, I said, right, what photographs or documents do you have? He said, I don't have any because we were in Hurricane Katrina. The house was under 10 or 12 feet of water. We lost everything. OK, so my job while, while Calvin was writing the um, the book was to hunt down documents, newspaper cuttings, photographs, the lot. 
and, and that's what I set out to do. So my first port of call was the Centre for UFO Studies, set up by Heineck. Of course, Heineck was, was, was on site within two days of this thing happening. And QFOS sent me their file on it, PDF file. In the middle of this file is a one-page typewritten document. And it's dated October the 13th, so it's two days later. And you can tell it's typewritten because they've, they've typed the wrong date and they've gone over it. <laughs> yes. You know, we well. couldn't delete it in those days. I used to use a typewriter. The document sucked out puncture wounds. Mm. And it describes Charlie and Calvin stripping down to their underwear and being given the once over. And it said that Charlie Hickson had a mark on his inner forearm and Calvin Parker had a mark on the underside of his foot. Bear in mind, both gentlemen had reported feeling these marks, but it then went on to say, and there's photographs. Well, there were no photographs. There was just this document, which was intriguing. A good while later, I can't remember if it's a year or two years later, the same chap that had sent me this from QFOS emailed me out of the blue and said, Philip, I've been rooting through some files, not about Pascagoula, but I came across these. I'm sure you've already got them, but I thought I'd send them anyway. And lo and behold, it's the photographs mentioned in that document. And there you have Charlie Hickson's inner forearm with these marks on it and Calvin Parker's foot with these in depth, these marks underneath his foot. So here we have, we have the, you know, the witnesses themselves saying, I felt a prick in my arm. Calvin felt something in his foot. We have a document written about it. And then we have the photographs. And that's all in the book. And, and I was stunned. I mean, when you take any element of that on its own, it, it doesn't really amount to much, Paul. But when you put all three pieces of the puzzle together, for me, it's a compelling piece of evidence that whatever happened that night, there was a physical component to it. And it left its marks on the two men involved, Charlie and Calvin. Mm -hmm. And you might not agree with me, but it's all there. You can you can see what how it all came about. You can read the document. You can view the photographs and reach your own conclusion. You know, it is as simple as that. But but that's how research works, because I have pestered anybody and everybody involved. Oh, have you got anything on Pascagoula? And you can hear the. I can hear them saying, oh, I help. He's here again. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but, you know, so long as you're polite, yep. then I'd be grateful when somebody does. It might only be a newspaper coin, you know, thank them for it and just leave them with the, with the message. If you find anything else, please let me know. Uh, and it is as simple as that. And, and it's worked time and time again. And I, I find that piece of evidence quite compelling. Others may disagree, which is fine. I have no problem with that. I mean, there are so many aspects of this that show that when the event happened, people took them very, very seriously, Philip. Regardless mm -hmm. of what people have liked to poo-poo it and say it was you know, nonsense, like a hypnagogic dream state that Charlie had, and therefore he was able, within two hours of this event happening and then being picked up by the police, that he was able to convince Calvin of the story, which is one of the yes. explanations I've seen, which is uh, from the, the usual candidate of that period, Philip, and we'll, we'll not bother wasting any more time discussing that person and their methods. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but clearly the authorities thought there was something going on, because why did they take them to Kessler Air Force Base if they didn't? Well, exactly. I mean, Charlie and Calvin, after the incident had finished, I mean, they were scared out of their wits, mm. especially Calvin. Charlie had been in the in the army before uh, and had been in the Korean War and had been in some quite heavy battles. Yeah. So he got more of a life experience than than you know this tough young fella had, and uh, and they decided not to speak to anyone. Now Calvin, bear in mind, he's getting married in November, um, and that was one of the reasons he didn't want the story getting out. He thought my father-in-law won't let me marry him. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he bought a brand new car, yeah. which they were driving. He was driving that night. When they returned to the car, the passenger side window shattered and fell out, mm. and it wouldn't start. It took about 20 attempts to start it. So as they're heading home, Charlie had a change of heart. He says, no, son, we have to tell somebody. What if these things come back and mm. do this to somebody else? What if it's an invasion? So they pull in at a, um, you know, a little shop that's got a payphone. They have no money for the payphone. 
You know, they're literally trying to put their hands down the seats in the car, and Calvin says it's a new car. There's no money falling down in between the seats. Anyway, so Charlie phones Keesler Air Force Base, which is nearby, and they said, we're not in the UFO business anymore. Ring your local authorities. So that's exactly what they do. And um, law enforcement says, where are you? Right, stay there. We'll send a car out. And they actually sent a car out. First thing they did was give them a sobriety test. Make sure they're not drunk. You know, I don't know if you walk in a straight line, touch your nose, whatever it is they did, but they did. And then they escorted them into town to the Jackson County Sheriff's Department, where they were interviewed separately. And um, they were then put in a room together. And unbeknownst to them, there was a tape recorder going in the desk next to them. Yeah. The deputy come back later and took something out of the desk. They had no idea what it was, and it was the tape. And they played it back thinking, well, we've got them now, you know. But, of course, on that tape, um, they're still talking about what's happened. Calvin is crawling up the walls almost. You know, he's crying almost, praying. So, you know, the the – Shuddy Fred Diamond, who was in charge, and his deputies had a change of heart then. They thought, well, these guys are for real, mm. you know. And they sent them home, you know, get yourself off home. And they said, please, please, Sheriff, don't tell anybody. And he said, I won't. But somehow, somebody, the story got out the next day, and, and they they all blamed each other. And, of course, it wasn't any of them there. To this day, Calvin doesn't know how the story got out. But what is interesting, we, we were in communication with the the police dispatcher who was on on duty that night. So he's the chap who took the t- telephone call from Charlie Hickson. Mm. And he says, Philip, I took over 50 phone calls of people who reporting UFOs. And he says, when my shift was finished and I went back to the station, there was people in there in person reporting it, one of whom was a pastor. <laughs> now, that may well have been the pastor, Emmanuel Sigalas, yep. who eight years later was interviewed by our colleague Stephanos from Greece. Yep. You know, and uh, so it'll give you some idea. Two days after, Sherry Fred Diamond had his own sighting, you know, and we have a vintage uh, radio interview with uh, Fred Diamond, the sheriff, the following morning. So this is October the 12th. I think the reporters come looking for Charlie and Calvin and they can't find them. So next best, I'll interview the sheriff. And the sheriff says they're in the hospital as we speak. And, um, they were checked over. Everything was all right. And somebody said, what about radiation? Oh, we can't do that. You'll have to go to Keesler Air Force Base. Mm-hmm. So that's where they were taken. Somebody run the Geiger counter over them. They're fine. And they said, while you're here, gentlemen, why don't you tell us what happened? Bear in mind, they'd phoned them the night before. So they went and they told them and, and they too recorded it. But they didn't have a tape. It was a stenographer. Yeah. And there's a full transcript of that in the book with the names of everybody that was in attendance, uh, et cetera. So we've got first-hand eyewitness testimony from both gentlemen from the night it happened in, in the sheriff's department and the following day at Keesler Air Force Base. The only thing that was missing, Charlie and Calvin agreed that they would say that Calvin passed out when the creatures came out of this thing and that he couldn't remember anymore. Uh, but of course, he didn't pass out, and that was that was Charlie's idea of, you know, taking the heat off his off his young friend. Yeah, protecting you know? him. Yeah, and that, and and when and when Calvin wrote his first book, he dedicated it to Charlie and called him a you know true American hero in his eyes, and um, that you know and that and, and he stuck to that story until he he published his first book with me, hmm. and then he told it in full for the first time. It- I mean, it just shows you that we've we've got these tantalising pieces of evidence. We've got a lot, so much stuff that proves that these two chaps were not the only people here. Obviously, one of the the, the biggest surprises, I would imagine, Philip, is obviously what happened when Calvin had been on television in 2018, and and the news channel put the interview up on YouTube, I believe, and mm. somebody left a comment saying. My mum and dad were on the other bank. Yeah. I know what happened, which is the Blairs. And yeah. this is one of those strange stories where, yeah. now forgive you can correct me if I'm wrong, Philip, they just thought something strange had happened and didn't think much of it. Mr. Well, Blair became seriously ill and then yeah. told his wife what had actually happened and she began to remember that well, it, it's, it wasn't it's, odd. It's similar to that. Yeah, I mean, Calvin was interviewed. They did a little minute 
a, and somebody put it on YouTube. And one of the comments, as you rightly said, said my mum and dad were on the opposite side of the river that night and they too saw the UFO. And this learnt me a very valuable lesson because there were lots of comments underneath, but it's, it's now taught me to go through them no yes. matter how long it takes. Yes. And of course, this person left, used their real name. And, and I managed to find her on, again, on social media. I explained who I was and could I speak to our mum and dad? And that was Mr. and Mrs. Blair, Jerry and Maria. Mm. Uh, and, I, and I remember speaking to them and, um, and old Maria said to me right, right from the start, Paul, she, she said, we saw the blue lights over the other side of the river. Uh, we were there because my husband was going out on a boat. Uh, and the chief was like, you know, the, the captain were waiting for him. I think they supplied the oil rigs out in the Gulf, that kind of thing. So he's going to be gone a few days. Yeah. And we're waiting. He's grumpy. And we see these blue lights flying around and see it looked like it was lost or it was looking for something. And then they decided to go and put their stuff on the boat anyway. The chief hadn't arrived yet. And there was a huge splash in the water next to her. She looks down and she says, there's a grey mat in the water. <laughs> and he went under and he'd come back up. And, and Mr. Blair said he saw the lights and things like that. But that was about it. He, you know, he didn't really want to talk about it. But she did say to me, she says, I've often thought if something might have happened to me and Jerry, like happened to Charlie and Calvin. She had some vague memories of seeing something, almost as if she'd seen it out of her peripheral vision and can't quite make it out. But there, there was something there. And of course, she she went on a local news thing herself with Jerry and, and mentioned this. And um, Jerry took ill. He was very ill. Yeah. And he said he started to tell her, you know, look, we were abducted that night. This is what happened. And even though he was very ill, Maria was mad as hell at him. And he was literally in the hospital, Paul, about to have... A pacemaker put in. Yeah. And I've, I've got one myself. Absolutely. And it was a, you know, it's not a major operation, but he was really ill. Yeah. And um, he insisted on speaking to me from the hospital. And I did. I spoke to him. And then he made, uh, uh, Maria said to him, right, start talking. And she filmed a small piece of him on her mobile phone. Yeah. And he's literally sat on the bed in the hospital. You know, I think he's still got a couple of stickers on him where he's had an ECG. Yeah. And and then he came out of the operation OK, but he was still gravely ill. And to his dying breath, Paul, he, he tried to tell Maria what had happened. And uh, they were there on the opposite side of the river that night. He, but their two daughters knew only that they'd seen these blue lights. That's all they knew. They, he never told anyone, not even his daughters, and not even, certainly not Maria. And she said, why didn't you tell me? So I was just trying to protect you. I didn't want people thinking we're crazy, yeah. you know. But but he's dying now, so he's, he's no need to worry about that. And then, sadly, he, he did pass away. And um, Maria, Mrs. Blair, suggested she'd like to have regressive hypnosis mm -hmm. and uh, I said well I could, we might be able to help with that but I, I didn't think it was the right time because she was still really upset about her husband dying so we we left it yeah. and then last year um, she mentioned it again only briefly I said look okay I'll look into this I can, there's no guarantees and I contacted a few hypnotherapists in the sort of general area one step forward and said yeah I can, I can do this and um we arranged for the hypno hypnosis to be done at Calvin's house because he'd had it previously. So he, he understood the procedure, you know, uh, and she wasn't in some stranger's place. She knew Calvin by this time. They'd become friends. Uh, but the hypnotherapist knew nothing about the subject. We didn't tell her a thing. All we told her was the date, the time, the location. Mm -hmm. So she put Maria under aggressive hypnosis and I hired a, a cameraman to film it professionally as well. So we have it, you know, on audio and video. And she told us this story about these creatures. Three of them got hold of her, her husband, one of her, and she closed her eyes. And this is the bit she talked about that she can remember. It's not out of her peripheral vision. She's actually got her eyes closed and she just opens them a, a touch and she can see little bits and pieces. And she said they harvest her, her eggs. They were interested in DNA. And she said they were doing it to, to so they could walk among us and not be recognized. That That's what she said. It's all. There's a full transcript of it in the book. 
along with some, you know, still photographs from the video. And again, make of it what you will. Uh, if I didn't publish it, I, somebody would say, well, what are you hiding? You know, yeah. <laughs> so it is there and uh, it is what it is, you know. And then a few weeks later, we used this again. I shouldn't laugh, but uh, on part of the video, when Mrs. Blair starts talking about this, you see the look on the face of the hypnotherapist. <laughs> she had no idea what was coming, you know. Yeah. And 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 uh, so a few weeks later, we used the same hypnotherapist, uh, same location, but this time with Calvin. Bearing in mind, he, he'd already been under hypnosis before, so he knew, he, you know. And I, I asked, I, I gave the hypnotherapist a couple of questions to ask. One of which was, before anything happens, Calvin is stood on the pier, an old pier, an old wreck with his fishing rod, and he's lying in the water, it's dark. Just ask him to s describe what he can see in front of him. So she did. And he said, well, I can see this boat going out, you know, because it's a huge river, it goes out to sea, mm -hmm. still shipbuilding on it today. Does he, this is what I must remind people of. This is not a, an out-of-the-way bayou in Mississippi somewhere. It's right next to Highway 90, which has a huge road bridge going right over the river. So he said, I can see the bridge, you know, and right at the very end, a little throwaway comment. He says, oh, and I can see two figures on the other side of the river. Now, I asked the question in the book and I don't know were those two figures, Mr. and Mrs. Blair, or was it somebody else? Mm. I don't know. You know, uh, and again, we have the full transcript of that hypnosis session in the book. And again, make of it what you will. I asked Calvin, for example, I said, you know. The hypnosis help you. They said, I don't need hypnosis, Philip. I can remember it all anyway. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but we filmed it. Also, we have it for posterity as well. He says it, it, it clarified one or two little things for him, but nothing in, in any great detail. And um, we were on the uh, the Unexplained with Howard Hughes on Talk TV yes. the other Sunday. Mm -hmm. and, and Howard got a, um, a telephone interview with Mrs. Blair. She doesn't have access to a computer. And... Uh, Howard's now put uh, the whole show up on YouTube and on on the podcast, so you can uh, you can listen to the audio. Yeah. And he has the full uh, half hour interview uh, on the podcast. He, he couldn't play a half hour of it on the TV, and I, and he kindly sent me a copy. Hmm. And in it, she's she's retelling the story, you know, that we already know. But she said she'd like to undergo hypnosis again. I don't know if that'll happen or not, but um, she's it's certainly not scared her. Um, she, she was quite emotional hmm. uh, during it and afterwards. Um, but uh, it is what it is. Some people say regression taps into your fantasies and things like that. They may well be right. Others say, no, if you use it properly, it's a useful tool. Uh, you know, and again, like all the other evidence that we have, it's in the book. You decide for yourself. I mean, when I spoke to Irina at the beginning of last year, Philip, the thing that intrigued me about her latest book was this sonic boom. Oh, yeah. When, yeah. when you look at it in isolation, you just think, well, yeah, that's a bit odd. But then when yeah. you look at it and yeah. think, hang on a minute, what was going on in Mississippi at that time? All of a sudden, there's yet another strand to this case. It's, yeah. it's yeah. remarkable how... So many things keep popping up, Philip. Yeah, well, f again, for those that are not aware, but Irina's from Ohio. She still lives there now. She still lives on the family farm. Yeah. But on October the 11th, 1973, the day of the Parker and Hickson encounter, she was away from home. She was studying for her PhD. Yeah. And her mother phoned her. I think, I think you know, 600 miles away was, was their home. And she says, there's been this huge explosion. This sonic boom. And I mum even said it, it it shattered one of the little the little windows in the barn. Yeah. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But that's what she said. And she says it's astonishing. So as as Irina became, you know, a scientist, she is, she you know, she's retired now, she's an academic. Uh, a few years down the line, she decided to look into this sonic boom. 
And she worked with seismologists, contacted, you know, everybody in his dog <laughs> to see if she could find a, a, a cause of it, a location. Well, you know, what caught it went halfway across America, Paul. Yeah. And there's newspaper accounts of it. Again, this is all featured in, in the new book. And she couldn't, she could not find a rational explanation for it, a cause of it. And she's confident that it is the second loudest noise ever recorded on Earth. Because she 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 goes through how certain things that make a sonic boom, for example, a jet aircraft at a reasonable altitude, and I've heard the sonic boom. Yes. Um, yeah, you, yeah. It, you can hear it in a radius of about two miles. Yeah. That's all. The higher the altitude these aircraft are at, it doesn't go as far because the atmosphere is thinner. This thing went halfway across the United States, same night as the Parker and Hickson encounter. And not only that, Paul, and again, I've been, you know, we've had a bit of criticism about this. There were sightings just before the Hickson and Parker event and some after it. Yeah. It was almost as if the Hickson and Parker case was like the, the culmination of it all. That was the peak of it. And there was a whole rash of sightings across the United States. Uh, there is a, a publication that came out a couple of years later or a few years later, and it's called, you know, the 1973, the year of the humanoids. Yeah. And just so happens, here's a hint for a new book coming on October the 1st. Kevin Randall, I'll be publishing it. And it is called 1973, the year of UFO sightings, you know, abductions and landings. And it, it tells the story of the other things that happened in 1973. Mm. So like we said, through popular culture, things happened. But in, in, in the UFO field, other things were happening at the time and just before and just after and in the surrounding area as well. So some people have said, well, that's that's not relevant. Well, I, I, I would I tend to disagree. If you look at this as a criminal case, you know, and, and somebody's been burgled, for example, and you say, well, anything elsewhere? Is there a pattern? Did they go and rob somebody else's house in the next town or, or whatever? You know, that's how. And again, we, we have some of this and we've, we've published it and you make up your own mind. Well, I don't see how it's not relevant, Philip, like you say, because going back to the Phoenix Light, prime example, everybody focuses on the main sighting over Phoenix during that evening. Some people completely disregard the thousands of eyewitnesses who saw this large triangular craft flowing down the country towards Phoenix in Arizona. Philip, people ignore the sightings that had happened in the months preceding it, that happened in the months after it. I don't see how that can't be relevant. If there's something going on, you need to look for patterns and evidence and information and if there was stuff going on before, this is the other aspect of all this as well is it wasn't just happening in the sky was it there was stuff being seen in the river well that's right on i think it was november the 6th i mean it, it, you know so it's, it's like three weeks later mm -hmm. in in pascagoula same river just a bit further out so it's a little bit deeper uh three little fishing boats three little skiffs you know go out with their nets one night and they see this thing under the water and it lights up and it's circular. It's about 30 feet in diameter. It's segmented. They said a bit like the old fashioned parachutes that had segments in. They got so close, Paul, they could hit it with their oar and it went plunk. Mm -hmm. The lights went out. They appeared somewhere else and they played cat and mouse with it for half an hour or so. They, they then went in person to the Coast Guard station and reported it. The Coast Guard sent a boat out. They saw it. And they hit it, and it also went plunk. <laughs> the next day, the Navy sent a guy out, you know, and um, what again, this, this is where you get great cooperation from your colleagues. We have all the Coast Guard documents in the book, as well as the full story of what happened that night. There's even a handwritten letter by, by one of the Coast Guard crew as well. But what the Coast Guard did the next day, they lined all the witnesses up on the on the quayside and took a photograph of them yeah. in colour. And it was a colleague said, oh, do you know so-and-so's got a fo that photograph? No, I didn't. Yeah, so-and-so, have you got that photo? Oh, yeah, here you go, Philip. And again, <laughs> he sent me a scan of the front and the back, and on the back was everybody's name and everybody's age. Oh. Now, we've got all the names on the Coast Guard documents anyway, but what I did, again, social media, put that colour photograph on there, with everybody's names, anybody know these people? Within literally a couple of hours, 
a lady had contacted me and she said, yeah, they're all deceased bar one. And and that was a member of her family was the one that was left. Mm. And I think he's, I think his name's Earl Ryan. And I said, can we speak to him? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and within a couple of days, we got the phone number and Irina had interviewed and nobody, nobody had bothered to interview him since that day. Yeah. You know, so we have another unique interview. And he said, again, he said, well, they sent this Navy guy and he says, show me where it happened. And he's thinking this guy's stupid. I, it's just water. There's nothing there. And I took, and he said, I took him out and showed him it happened there. There's nothing to see. It's just water. And there was rumors um, that was reported in the sort of UFO uh, magazines at the time that the Navy were going to issue a, a a report on it. But I, 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 if they did, I certainly haven't seen it and can't find it. And I've contacted the Coast Guard and the Navy and so on. They have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. Um, but again, some people have said it's it's got nothing to do with the Pastor Gula case that happened three weeks beforehand. I would argue that it must do. It's in the same location, just a bit further out in the same river. And it is bizarre. It is truly, truly bizarre. This thing went clunk and it's under the water, you know, and you make of it again of what you will. You know, we've got some artwork that's been done. You know, it's artist impression as well. Mm. But um Again, what? The, the, probably the two the two best known abduction cases are Betty and Barney Hill and Travis Walton. Yeah. Betty and Barney Hill didn't go under hypnosis for several years yes. after the event. Yeah. There is no independent eyewitnesses. There's no other sightings from around there at the time. Nothing. Basically, you just have what the hills tell you and their hypnosis uh, and a few bits and pieces. Same with Travis Walton. You can't really call his 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 colleagues that night as independent eyewitnesses because they're not. They're all friends. Yeah. Not saying the lion or anything, quite the opposite. Mm. But there is no other independent eyewitnesses. There was nothing else happening in the area. There is no documentation. There is nothing. This case is quite the opposite. Mm. It has first-hand independent eyewitnesses. One of the criticisms back in 1973 there's the motorway bridge, or the highway bridge, they call it. Nobody driving across it's seen anything. No, no. What you, what you should be saying is that nobody has come forward. Yeah. But they did. Yeah. There was a chap called Mr. Rusty Anderson. He said, I'm driving over that bridge that night, Philip, with my wife. And he said, I see this, this whitish blue thing down below me. He thought it was an aircraft at first. It's so low, he says, I thought it was going to crash. You know, I thought it was going to crash. And I think it was either the next day or the day after he went to visit a, a relative who lived down by the river. And they said, hey, never guess what I saw the other night. <laughs> well, of course he did, because he'd seen it. Now, <laughs> just so everybody is aware, we are also making, as we speak, it's done uh, a new documentary uh, featuring a lot of what we've been talking about tonight. Mr. Anderson was one of the witnesses that's been interviewed for it. Mm. And he put on Facebook just a little thing, just being interviewed for a documentary. And, and, you know, on Facebook, they get comments underneath it. And there was a lady there, and she said, oh, I saw that thing that night. Again, read the comments. I've already learned my lesson. <laughs> so I contacted her, and she's called Pamela, Pamela Rayleigh Eves. And she was putting her, her son to bed that night, and she goes to see the, close the curtains. What does she see out in the distance? This blue thing. Mrs. Eves, he's Rusty's, Mr. Anderson's, cousin yeah. and neither of them knew of each other's sightings because their names are totally different she's married of course got a different name so even family members weren't talking about it paul you know and and again these halfwits who say she wanted 15 minutes of fame it was one line on a facebook posting that's not looking for 15 minutes of fame and had i not read it you know, she would have probably never said anything about it to anyone ever. Mm. But she, she granted us with an interview. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's just an, another one of the many individuals that are in the book. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing about this case, Philip, that makes it so remarkable is that everybody involved who saw something was just doing normal things. They weren't out there looking for UFOs. They weren't obsessed with UFOs. They weren't alien crazy. These were normal people driving, fishing, putting their kids to bed, walking. Yeah. Absolutely. Working. Nobody was looking for anything odd. And they all experienced something that's changed their life. Well, you've got to remember with, with, with 
Calvin Parker, he didn't live in that area. He didn't know it. He lived a couple of hundred miles away. Yeah. And he got engaged um, to his wife, wife to be, Waynette. And he was working three or four jobs. You know, she never saw him. And it, their family had grown up with the with uh, the Hicksons. And it was it was Calvin's dad. I said, why don't you ring Charlie? He's a foreman at the shipyard. He might be able to get you a job. So he did. He rang him. Yeah, I'll get you a job. So the the idea was Calvin would would board and lodge at uh, at Charlie's Monday to Friday, pay him you know a few dollars, yeah, then go home on a weekend. Yeah, great. His first day at work was Thursday, October the eleventh, nineteen seventy three. <laughs> he says I got hired, fired, and abducted in the same day. <laughs> and and that's true. That's exactly what happened. So Calvin didn't know the area. When they were driving out to the fishing spot that night, it was Charlie who was giving directions. Calvin was driving, but he had no idea where he was going. Because somebody said, well, just recently, oh, it could have been some kind of mind control experiment. Well, how the hell did they know they were going to be there that night? They only decided on the way home from work, you know, that they go fishing. Both both of them love fishing. Calvin, to this day, loves his fishing. Yeah. So how, how could they know they were there? Because there was no plans to go there. And not only that, you know, what kind of mind control, you know, that would that would a leave physical marks upon their bodies as well, and have all the independent eyewitnesses see what was happening, these blue things flying around, and another encounter with the Blairs on the opposite side of the river. Were there being mind controlled as well? Yeah. Right. I think mind control is is a, is a more exotic theory yes. than anything else. I really do. Yes. But there you go. But who knows? Who knows? Absolutely. Well, it, it means somebody else, was it? Uh, the gentleman, was it Larry Booth? He was sat watching telly. Yeah, yeah. And even dates it by saying, yeah, I was watching Kung Fu, which is obviously... Is it David yeah. Carradine that was in that? Yeah, I, I remember it. Yeah, I do. I remember watching it. It was always repeated a lot when I was a kid. I didn't, didn't watch it when it was when it was fresh on the channels, but it was repeated to death into the 80s on uh, yeah. on British television, Philip. And I'd, I'd seen it plenty of times. So it's yeah. it's it's... These these things that just pop up. Cause he was interviewed within a, a week or so of that happening, and did that's a, right. Did an yeah, interview. Yeah, he did television. You know, he he he, he sort of just went out. You know, and, and there it was, and um, he knows what night it was because of the TV show he's watching. Yeah. <laughs> which is what you do, isn't it? I mean, yeah. in those days, it's like it's like when somebody gives you directions, turn left at the at the White Horse. Yes. You know. <laughs> yeah. You know where you'd be going because of, of certain signposts. One yeah. signposts in, in those days was what is watching on TV that night, yeah. you know? Yeah. And yeah. and a lot of these other witnesses, some people have said, well, how do they know it happened on that date? And I said, well, did they write it in the diary? I said, don't be stupid. What they, what happened was they saw Charlie and Calvin in the news either the day, the day after or a couple of days later and then put two and two together and, and said, that was the same night. You know, that was the same night as, as we saw that thing over there. Uh, and it, it, let's be honest, it, it, you know, it doesn't take a lot of doing. It, weren't, it wasn't as if somebody was on the local news every other week claiming to be abducted by aliens. Hmm. It was a one-off event that, that, that hit the news. So, but, uh, yeah, I mean, but like I say, Larry was one of those that, that, that stepped forward pretty soon. And, um, again, just start watching TV. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, he makes me chuckle because he he thought it. Yeah, that's a bit strange. That's a bit peculiar. Then he saw everything on the news and thought, oh no, <laughs> and then well, he got go. worried. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we have another lady in the book. I, I won't mention her name, but she, you know, she, she is mentioned in her uh, name in full. Yeah, uh, and there is a period of missing time with her. Mm. And um, I said to her, "Have you ever thought about exploring that missing time?" And she says, not on your life. <laughs> and that was it, you know, end of story. And yeah. I don't blame her, to be honest, you know. She says, no, I'm, hap I'm you know, I'm content to remember what I remember. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's it. And that's fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's better not to know. Mm. Absolutely. Well, Philip, it's, it's, it's an amazing book that this case just keeps on growing and growing. As long as I've been doing this show now, since 29, March 2019, what Pascagoula was then to what it is now is... I would say it's tripled in size with everything that's come out, Absolutely. people that have come forward, these photos and letters and tantalising tidbits of information that have just appeared. It It's so fascinating that this, the longer it's going on, the more it seems to grow. And like you say, this is clearly time-sensitive 
because as as we've touched on, sadly Calvin is 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 seriously ill and is dealt with what he wanted to deal with, which which to to tell his tale unabated and and have nobody adapt it or change it or try and fit it into some other kind of narrative. And so everything else that's gone on since, I think, is vitally important to to supporting what happened to him and, and Charlie that night and everybody else who thought they were the only ones or felt that n- they couldn't speak to anybody, Philip, to discuss it. Yeah. It just shows the power of, of hard work, dedication and a dogged determination to track people down, Philip. And, uh, the, and there's not many more than better than you that can pull a tail out of somebody across the Atlantic at three in the well, morning. Well, it's not just me, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. uh, full credit to my colleague, Dr. Irina Scott. Yes. I could have, possibly done it without her it was just have taken a lot longer yeah um but we we've we, you know even if i do say so myself we, we've made a, a a good team and it shows you what you can do uh, when, when you know two like-minded people work together i'm just a miners coal miners sub from a small town outside of wakefield in west yorkshire yeah and if you'd have told me when i left school that the, the day would come that i would write a book with a bona fide phd an academic a scientist i would have laughed in your face <laughs> yes <laughs> but there you go that's life it is it is there is something to to say for our similar upbringings philip as i also grew up in a pit village yeah. and, if, and if you'd have said to me 45 years ago do you know you'll be sat chatting to people talking about bigfoot and i laughed in your face then yeah so absolutely. <laughs> never be surprised about what's around the corner well it's it's a it's an incredible piece of work that you've pulled together like you say with with dr scott helping you ably from the other side of the atlantic you've obviously got incredible illustrations from jason glebes another one of our mutual friends yeah fantastic cover showing those wonderfully creepy creatures that they encountered where on earth can everybody track the book down philip get a hold of the copy any other versions of it and anything else you've got coming out from flying disc press sir yeah i mean you know i, I i'm not being big headed but, but i think this is a, a significant publication mm. and um, we're, we're not bothered about the commercial side of it this is me trying to cement calvin's legacy as i promised i would do uh, and he knows that and i will continue to do and i know you know the current economic climate what we've done with this book there's two postings of it on amazon so you know on amazon you can pretty much buy it from anywhere in the world almost yeah so one post one one posting on amazon you will see the book paperback in a nine times six inch format. So that's the smallest format and the cheapest. Yep. You'll then on another another part of, of Amazon, you'll see the same paperback, but larger, 10 times eight. Obviously, it costs a bit more. Then there is a hardback, which is even bigger and is my favorite. It's 11 and a quarter inches by eight. It's a huge, great tome. It's also available on a Kindle and an audio book. So hopefully... There is something there for everyone's wallet. Uh, that's the best we can do. You know, we've we've kept it to as a minimum as prices that that, that we can. Uh, and all I would say is, if you if you're only going to buy one UFO book this year, possibly you might consider that this is the one. You know, there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears gone into it, and we think it's a significant addition to the UFO literature. We may be wrong, but there you go. And um, like I say, there's other things coming. We have the documentary based on our research coming later this year. There is also, just for a different audience, a graphic novel yes. available. And it's called UFO, The Closest Encounters. Uh, it, it's published by Moonstone Books uh, in America. And it's also The Forbidden Planet. So you can buy it online in the UK as well. Yeah. I think in the UK it's about £8.50 plus postage. I don't know what the American version is, $13 something or other. Yeah. But it's, again, illustrated by Jason Cleaves, written by Martin Powell. There's pieces from me and Calvin and a, a researcher called Brent Rains. Mm. But it's, again, it's taking this story to a, to a, a different audience. And and um, that is available as well. So, you know, hopefully you'll you'll find something there that, that suits you. I, I don't know when the documentary is coming out or where it will be available. Uh, but as soon as I do know, Paul, I'll, I'll let everybody know. Fabulous. Fabulous. So, Philip, what, what, what else is coming down the pipeline before I let you return to your the rest of your evening, sir? Well, we've got a whole raft of books for later this year and next year as well. I mean, I have 
a full slate for next year. I can't, I can't take on any more. <laughs> and some of these will be UFOs. There'll be a couple of paranormal books in the mix as well. And, um, hopefully, you know, something for, for everyone. Some of these will be first time authors. Some will be authors that have written a number of books. And what, what I aim to do next year, again, with the, with the Pascagoula case, we talked about hypnosis tonight. Well, there's been several hypnosis sessions down down the decades. Yes. And we've published them in different books. So what I'm going to do next year is bring the, all of those into one publication. So it'll be a lot of transcripts of hypnosis sessions, but it will m- maybe one just for the collectors, but it'll be all there in one work. So you know, if you if that's something you're interested in, you don't have to buy all four or five books. You know, it will all be there in, in, in one in one publication. Mm-hmm. And we've even had our first sniff at somebody interested in a documentary in it. Whether whether that pans out and gets any further remains to be seen. But um, that'll be a book that I'm doing just on my own. Hmm. So that'll be next year sometime. Excellent. And uh, who knows what might crop up between now and then, Paul? Oh, you never. The one thing about this subject is, Philip, you never know what's around the corner. You don't, mate. You don't at all. Fabulous. Well, listen, I'll put links to everything in the show notes as always. Thank you as always, Philip, for your time and your trouble and your support with my show. The the amount of times you've helped me out over the, over the four years of doing this is uh, is uncalculable. So I just want to thank you for your consistent and kind support, both through your other authors and yourself, for your time and the opportunities you give me to speak to some of the people under your label and, and working out the, the book company. So uh, I wish you the very best, and no doubt we uh, we shall speak soon, Philip. Thank you very much, Paul. Great pleasure, mate.